and glory. Let's stand together as we sing. church. We're so thankful for an opportunity to come and gather and worship King Jesus this morning. We just want to say welcome to you if you're here and in a, in a, in a member of Campbellsville Baptist Church. We're glad you're here to gather and worship with us. If you're visiting for the first time, we're glad you're here as well. If you're joining us online, we're thankful you're here joining us there as well. A couple of uh, announcements, actually just one major thing to kind of zoom in and focus on this morning. We have our, our big blowout VBS bash palooza, you name it, it's going to be there. We're going to have games and music and opportunities to register for VBS. I think there's going to be some food, maybe some prizes. There's going to be a lot of stuff. You don't want to miss this. It is, it is Friday, June 24th to kind of kick off our VBS week. VBS will begin on Sunday June 26th and roll through the, the Thursday of that following week. So we're excited. We want you to come uh, talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends, and let's, let's pack out our VBS because it's an opportunity for us to love on our community, share the gospel with all those, and be super intentional to do that. Let's continue in our worship and go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for an opportunity to worship uh, to, to celebrate the good work that your son Jesus has done on our behalf as believers, as we gather. Help us to acknowledge the goodness of your son Jesus, to, to worship and praise in your sovereignty, that our worship and our praise is not dependent on our circumstance, but it is dependent on your character and your perfection, the fact that you created us, you've redeemed us, and we are your child. Lord, for those who do not have a relationship with you this morning, they've not professed you as Lord and Savior. 
I pray that you will do a mighty work, that your spirit will be present and that you will move and transform hearts and minds as we sing and worship and grow in your word together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and continue in our worship this morning. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance by heavy stone Messiah still and all
you say amen this morning? Man, good morning. It is, uh, I don't know about you, but it's exciting for me. Um, I, I don't know if you realize this, I've been keeping track. I, I've been asked twice to preach in a little over a four-week time frame. That's pretty exciting for me. The more often I, I have an opportunity, the more that it just seems like it just grabs a hold of me just a little more. But also one other thing, I, I want you to be praying for our pastor. Uh, he and his family are in California. Uh, they're going to spend some time uh, vacationing, but also at the uh, SBC convention. And so they'll be traveling back later on this week. So um, just keep them in your prayers. This morning, we're going to continue our study in Titus. And uh, like I'd mentioned before, I'm going to use scripture to back scripture. So you may have to have a, a piece of paper that's handy. I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to write it down. I want you to go back and I want you to reread that so that you can know that I'm, I'm, I'm sharing with you God's word and not just something that I've come up with in my mind. So we're going to continue our journey and we're going to be looking at Titus chapter 2 verses 11 through 15 this morning. You know, Paul's laid out some pretty important things for Titus this morning, or this, this series. And we've seen that people that are believers in Jesus Christ, they were saved so they could serve. We've seen that uh, what church leadership looked like and what it should look like, the requirements for that. We've seen how to confront and how to lovingly correct false teachers and teachings. We've also seen over the last couple of weeks what a healthy church looked like, where those older men and women were shepherding and discipling those younger men and women. And this morning, as Paul begins to layer out this blueprint, we're going to see how God's grace changes everything. If you would, turn to Titus chapter 2 and please stand as we read God's word together. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lusts, and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He himself, he gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people of his own possession, eager to do good works. Proclaim these things, encourage and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Bow with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you. Lord, for another opportunity. Lord, I pray that this morning you just allow your hand to navigate through the sanctuary to where lives can be changed. And what we can see in the text can become so real and so vivid. Lord, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. When I think of the blueprint, Pastor Dwayne entitled this the blueprint for the church. When I think of a blueprint, I think of the ones that I used to look at. The blueprints I used to look at when I was hanging ceiling as a contractor, the blueprint was laid out in such a way that it had symbols and arrows and directions, it had a compass on it, and all of those things meant something. And so as I was looking at the print, you always wanted to check because it was inevitable that someone would turn one upside down or the prints would come loose. You always wanted to check the compass to make sure what north looked like in that building layout. And so as I got to thinking about that blueprint and then thinking about what Titus was receiving from Paul, all of these different layers that, that make up a healthy church, I couldn't help but think that when we come to this passage, what must have been rolling through Titus's mind as Paul was laying this out for him, the fact that grace, the grace given to us by God, changes everything within the believer. And this morning, we're going to be looking at this text and some others, but we're going to be looking at what it means to be saved by grace, taught by grace, and marked by grace. 
If you're here this morning and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you're going to have a clear vision of what that looks like for you this morning. Believer, I hope it calls us out a little bit. I hope it steps on our toes a little bit. Because as a follower of Jesus Christ, we need to first and foremost understand that we are saved by the grace of God. Look back at verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Yes, Jesus has appeared. Grace is here. You know, when I begin navigating after I was a believer in Jesus Christ, I began navigating the waters and I wanted to, to have conversations with people even before I was called into the ministry. But the minute I took salvation and I placed it in the same sentence with Jesus is the only way to heaven, as soon as I brought those two words together, salvation only offered through Jesus, conversations begin to dwindle. Conversations seem to fall apart because people are, are more than willing to talk about religious things. They're more than willing to talk about spiritual things. But as soon as you say salvation is only through Jesus Christ, then the wheels fall off and people start to scatter. You see, as, as a people, we have formulated what we want God to look like in our minds, and the God that we formulated in our minds doesn't often line up with the God of the Bible because we want a certain lifestyle. And so when this God that we've created in our mind doesn't line up with the God of the Bible, then the conversation is null and void at that point. People walk away. And in John 14, 6, it says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. In Acts 4, 12, it says, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given by which we must be saved. And in 1 Timothy 2, 5, it says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, and his name is Jesus. And so when we're saved by this grace of God, there are a few things that happen within us. One, we're cleansed. When we are saved by the grace of God, we're cleansed by the blood. Blood over time represents life and death, right? It represents the life and the death of something. During biblical times, it was also used for purification. It was used for consecration. It was used for atonement of our sins. And in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. You see, being saved by this grace means that God sent his son to die on a cross, a, a sinless death. And through that shed blood, you and I were offered this cleansing, this atonement. And it wasn't an atonement that has to be repeated. It was an atonement that was given once and for all. If you look down in Hebrews chapter nine and you go down to verse 25, we read this. He did not offer this many times as the high priest enters the sanctuary yearly with the blood of another. Otherwise, he would have had to suffer many times since the foundation of the world. But now he has appeared one time at the end of the ages for the removal of sin of the sacrifice of himself. You see, being, being saved by the grace means that we have an opportunity to become cleansed this morning. And Paul's wanting Titus to understand that being saved by this grace, it, it, the truth is you're going to be cleansed, but you're also going to be deliver, delivered. Being delivered doesn't seem, doesn't, doesn't simply mean that now that I'm a believer, I've been given a license to sin. That is totally the wrong outlook on life. Being delivered means that the sins that we have in our life are completely wiped away. They completely are vanished because of the sacrifice that God sent to us. 
In Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I want you to think about that for a moment. The day that you laid your life down and said, Jesus, I'm going to serve you. I want you as Savior. I'm going to follow you. Did you ever add that at the end of that, but my way is better? Did, did, you, did we ever think for a moment that the life we're laying down is also the day-to-day -day life that we're laying down? God has delivered us not only from our past, present, and future sin, but God has also delivered us from this day-to-day -day of having to worry about those things. God is the one that leads, guides, and directs. And when we lay our life down to him, that means that our day-to-day -day also is laid down. That verse also tells me in Romans that if I continue in my sin, that death is the ultimate consequence. It's the byproduct of my sin. My sin is what separated me from being delivered by the Savior. And it's a byproduct that death is going to happen. And then in John 10, verse 27 to 28, it says, my sheep hear my voice. This morning, if you've been saved by grace, you have an opportunity to hear the voice of God. He says that I hear them, I know them, and they do what? They follow after me. And he says, I, I, I give them eternal life. None of them should perish. This, this death that is at the end of a sinful life is going to happen, but being saved by the grace of God means that that. We have been called out. We, we have been bought with a price. And it means that we will never die. In that same passage right there, it says, being, uh, being, um, well, no one will snatch him out of our hand, out of his hand. In my mind, I've got this picture of us in the center of the, God's hand. And I, I have this picture of the blood that covers us. And if someone comes under that blood, they have to accept Jesus Christ. They're not going to reach their arm through there and pull us back away. We're forever delivered. Because it's God's hand who holds us. And so being saved by grace means that we're cleansed. It means that we're delivered, but it also means that we're heaven bound. We no longer are consumed by this life or or. We don't have to be entangled in what this world has to offer. We're heaven bound. In John 14, verses one through three, it says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. This is the, the wonderful part, I love it. In my Father's house are many rooms. Some translations say mansions. If it were not so, but I have told you that I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And then if I go, if God goes, if Jesus goes and prepares a place for you and I, being saved by this grace, if he prepares this place, guess what happens? He says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I mean, what a wonderful promise. I will, I will come again and I will take to myself, I will take you to myself so that where Jesus is, we can be there also. I mean, what a wonderful thing to be saved by this grace of God. And all too often sometimes, I think we miss it. I think we miss it. And Paul's wanting Titus to understand that, that those false teachers ultimately need to be saved by the grace of God. And they need to broadcast this teaching, this truth, so that these false teachers in Crete can, can understand that being saved by grace means so much more than what they think with the flip of the tongue. But in this text, he also says that we're going to be taught by grace. Look back at verse 12. Instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lust and live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in a present age. 
You remember back earlier in this chapter where Paul had to tell Titus when he was setting up the elders that he was going to need to use the gospel and the truth to confront what was going on? I mean, it wasn't a few weeks ago. And now we see that Paul earlier in this chapter said that these older men and women were going to to need to disciple the younger men and women. And so he's laying all of this out in such a way that, that those believers can be taught by God, taught by grace. He's laying those things out. Listen, the the more spiritually mature, if you're here and you're sitting in the pew, this word discipleship goes so much farther than sitting in that classroom. It goes so much farther than filling in some blanks on a piece of paper. I have no doubt that when Titus received this from Paul, Paul was like, dude, you've got to take these older men and women and they have to live life with these younger men and women. Because we have become stagnant in discipleship. I personally, outside of Sunday school, was not discipled. I was not discipled. I had a few guys, that, older guys, that would talk and converse. But man, to, to sit down and personally talk about God's word and how that impacts my life and have it, it's important. Austin, one of our church planners, I tell you, by the way, I've, I've fallen in love with this whole concept of church planning and church revitalization, it's amazing. I'm, I'm all in, both feet. But Austin, when we were up there the last time, Austin said, dude, I'm, I'm discipling two guys. And I said, that is wonderful. They're ones from another church that ended up coming to his church. Austin's in his early 30s, I believe. These men are in their mid-70s. He said they come to him And they said, Austin, we'd like for you to disciple us. We have never been discipled. I want us to wrap our mind around the fact that 75, 76-year-old men in Austin's church, a new church plant, have never been discipled. And they said that they they want to, to be able to to learn more about God. They they want to trust God deeply. They want to be hands and feet. And what really got me was the last statement. The last statement that Austin shared. He said that these men said that they didn't want to waste the rest of their lives. I want you to think about that. That's saying that 70 years of their life plus since they had not been discipled, that they were skimming the top of the barrel when it comes to their relationship with Jesus Christ. They never went any further. And I'm telling you, no matter how old you are, we need to be discipled. Paul understood the importance of those older men and women discipling the younger. And believe it or not, in this case, sometimes we are called to be the student and then we are called to be the teacher and then we are called to be the student again. Because for me, being a student of God is a daily thing, is a daily basis. Because I want to be taught by grace. I mean, it's time that we take and we wrap our arms and embrace 2 Timothy 3.16. For all scripture is inspired by God. This God breath, this God breathed word of God. It's time that we embrace that and understand, church, that it is profitable for teaching, rebuking, and correcting and training in righteousness. You see, God has, God has so much to teach us 
in his word. He has so much to teach us in those saints that have been living a godly life for years. He has so much to teach us, so much to offer us. But Paul also lays out and says, look, Titus, there's going to be some things that you're going to have to walk away from. And he says, you're going to have to deny the ungodly. So we're going to have to deny the things that do not bring honor and glory to God. This word denied here means to disown or disassociate with. So I challenge you this week, I challenge you today, anything that is ungodly in your life, from the smallest thing on your phone to the largest thing in your life, I challenge you to remove that and disassociate with it. And then I challenge you, because it's easier said than done, I challenge you to take and I, I, I challenge you to interject God in place of what you were doing that was ungodly. That's being taught to deny the ungodly in our life. First Corinthians 10, 34 says, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Listen, our lives should be oozing out of every poor God. We should have God in every angle of our life so that no matter if we're in the supermarket, no matter if we're at the gas station, no matter if we're here in this building, that everyone should be able to recognize that we are, we are belonging to Jesus Christ. And it should be out of our pores that people are able to see that. The aroma that we sin should say Jesus, it should be all over it. In 1 Corinthians 15, 34, I've kind of fell in love with this verse. I hated this verse at first, I'll just be honest with you. Because when I read over this verse, it smacked me right between the eyes. In 1 Corinthians 15, 4, this is what it says, if you're not familiar with it. It says, come to your senses and stop sinning. We talk about rejecting the ungodly and the denying the, the ungodly and denying the worldly lusts. And, and in this text, it says, come to your senses, stop sinning. Why do we need to stop sinning? We need to stop sinning because there are people ignorant about God. Listen, a lot of times we, we don't think any of the ungodly things in our life really affect anybody but us. You know, the sin, we don't think it affects anybody but us. But, but we're told to deny those things because it does. There are people ignorant without knowing God, without the Lord. And because we are continuing a lifestyle that mirrors their lifestyle, we're keeping those people ignorant of who God is. They just don't know because our lives don't look any different. And he goes on, he says, deny worldly lust. This, by definition, is an intense and an unrestrained desire or craving. Usually focuses on self-pleasure and leads to unwholesome actions. Has no regard, usually, to consequences. You see, the Bible addresses this worldly lust. It, it addresses it in Titus chapter 2, Exodus 20, Matthew 5, Job 31, and several other places throughout God's word, it, it addresses those. In Romans 6, 19, it says that we were slaves to impurity and greater lawlessness. But now, because we've been saved by grace and we're being taught by grace, now, it says... That we need to be slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, it says, do not, do not you know that the body, this body is a temple for the Holy Spirit? Our, our body is a temple for the Holy Spirit who is, who is within us, whom you have from God, it's not your own. Listen, the, the body that we have, is, it doesn't belong to us anymore. We've been saved by grace, we're being taught by grace. This body, it, it doesn't belong to us anymore. It's not ours. 
It says to deny what this body craves. And like I said, I, I work with teenagers a lot, but that little phone, that little device sometimes can be detrimental to someone's relationship with Jesus Christ. It's like a vice. And it keeps the ungodly and the worldly lust right at your fingertips all the time. In Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm not going to read all these in, in verses 20 and 24, we're told to come to our senses. Why do we need to come to our senses? Because we know God. We're, we're to take off these old clothes. We're, we're to remove those things. Listen, you don't want to go back to what you were before you met Jesus. We're told to take those off. And we're told to be renewed by the Spirit and, and put on the new self. Listen, we're to, we're to strive to live the holiest life that we can in line with God's Word. And then Paul lays out some other things for Titus. He says, you know, once you're saved by grace, as you're, be, as you're being taught by grace, you, you, you need to remove those ungodly things. But he also says we need to live in a sensible way. We need to live in a self-controlled way, a soberly way. This deals with our Christian behavior. This is something Paul is, has already mentioned in Titus 1, 8, 2, 2, and 2, 5. We see that Paul sets the stage earlier for those that would lead, and he says, look, you've got to lead differently. Your life has got to be different. And he laid out those expectations for each of those older and younger believers. And in Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 10, it says there, therefore put to death what belongs to your earthly your earthly self. And he goes through a lot of things from, from sexual immorality all the way to adultery. And he says to put off anger and wrath and malice, slander, filthy language. The, the students think I'm crazy because I have not said a cuss word since 1991. And it has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with God. In the construction field, I knew that if when I accepted Christ at the age of 18, I knew that if there was one thing in my life that was gonna set a tone and make a difference and give me credibility to share Christ with those I worked with, it was that my filthy language had to cease because I was pretty bad. And, and we're told that we need to put all that off we're told not to lie to each other. We're to put on the new self. We don't want to go back to the old practices. And so we're to live in a sensible type of way before God. And so our lives need to continually be different. But he, Paul also tells Titus that he needs to live in a righteous kind of way. This word nobody likes. This means conform with God's requirement. Conform to God's requirements. We don't like that. That word conform usually has negative things. But Paul is telling Titus that in order to, to allow the people of Crete to understand you've been saved by grace, you're being taught by grace, that you need to conform to what God is requiring for your life. Paul already claimed this for himself and the companions that were with him in 1 Thessalonians 2.10. In Romans chapter 12, verses 17 and 18, it says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful, give careful thought to what you do and that it's honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with each other. Being taught by grace means that our lives are going to be lived in a righteous way to where we are going to, to try to find unity and we are trying to build a gap because we have a message that we want to take to the unsaved and the unbelieving. Paul's telling Titus, you're going to have to bridge this gap. You're going to have to help me. He says we need to live in a sensible way, a righteous way, and then also he says that we need to live in a godly way. <clears throat> this means that my life needs to be lived in a godly manner. 
It means the grace of, my, of, of God that is within me needs to be on display everywhere I go. When I talk to students and I talk to children, a lot of times they're interested in the baptistry. They want to know if they can be in the baptistry. <laughs> well, you can, and if you're in the baptistry without Jesus, then you're just in a hot tub. Because it's the change that happens within that causes the obedience to do that. And it's the change from within. It's, it's living in a godly way now that we are saved by grace, being taught by grace. In Colossians 3, 15 through 17, it says, And let the peace of Christ, which you were also called in one body, to rule your heart and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell among you. If the word of God richly dwells among us, then we are not going to be quick to anger. We're not gonna be quick to sever ties of a relationship. If, if, if God dwells within us, it says in all wisdom and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, Singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. Listen, living in a godly way, I don't know how else to explain it, but our preferences are no longer valid. Our preferences about Bible study, our preferences about worship, our precedence about all of what goes on in our church, things like that, it is of no more value. We are to lay those things down. Our personal preference shouldn't have a bearing when it comes to God. Living in a godly way means we've set ourselves aside and said, Lord, I'm yielding to your spirit because your way is better. That's what it means to live in a godly way, at least to me. Because I've spent my life, 11 years of my life, playing the game of Christian. And I believe I drove more people away from God than I ever did bringing them to God. Because I was living the lie. I was not living in a godly way. What I was saying was not matching up with my life. It didn't work. And, and Paul wants Titus to understand, listen, you have got to live in a godly way. Because these lost people on the, on the island of Crete, they need to hear the truth. And so we're saved by grace. We're taught by grace. We're also marked by grace. What does this look like for us? Look back at verses 13 and 14. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. You know, I think of Mark, I think about that blueprint. And I think about when I would look at those ceiling drawings, I had to go back to the main print, find that room number, find the, the, the notes on that room and go back because that blueprint was not only marked here, but it was also marked here, here, and here because on a ceiling, you've got, you've got sprinkler heads that come through. You've got electrical lines coming through. And so you have to find all of the markings to go back so you can look at the print fully. And Paul is, is telling Titus that being marked by the Savior means that he's going to have to go back and study the truth and embrace the truth. They are saved. They are being taught by grace, and they're going to need to embrace that. Do you remember in your life when you said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm in need of the Savior. I'm broken. I'm undone. Forgive me of my sins. Help me, Lord. I'm lost. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, whether you realized it or not, you became marked. 
That started your journey. That started your exciting opportunity to, to be in a family, in the family of God. Paul here says that being marked means that we're going to continually look for Christ, looking for Christ's return. Jesus was already here on this earth. The next time, he's not coming back the same way. He, he's not coming back the same way. This, this word, looking for Christ, this consistent expectation, this, this wanting and waiting for this blessed hope that Jesus will split the sky wide open because he's coming after his people. It's not a what if type of hope. It's a guarantee. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 17, we read, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, so that you do not grieve like the rest with no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose, rose again in the same way, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For we say this to you from the Lord. We who are alive when the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend. Check this out. The Lord himself will descend with with, with, through heaven with a shout, an archangel's voice, and with a trumpet sound, the dead in Christ shall rise. Listen, we are to continually, being saved by grace, being taught by grace, understand that we are marked by grace, we are continually to be looking for the Lord's return. I think it's imperative that we Repeat to ourselves: Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ is coming again. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ is coming again. Why is that important? Because as a believer that is saved by grace and, and a believer that is taught by grace and a believer that is marked by grace, that if we say that over and over again, it puts that mission of God that God placed us on right there at our foreface, right in front of us. We are striving to go that direction. Because we read about the mission that you and I have been on in Acts 1.8. It says that we will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. We will be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And in Matthew chapter 28, 19, and 20, it says, Go therefore make disciples of all nations. Leaning back to the fact that Titus wasn't, wasn't being told something that wasn't true. Titus was being told that the older men and women were to disciple. And so in Matthew chapter 28, it says, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Spirit. And you're going to be my witnesses everywhere, everywhere. And, and he says, look, don't worry about it because I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you everywhere you go. And so being marked by grace means that we have this expectation of Christ's soon return. But Paul goes ahead and he says, look, Titus, you're going to be a peculiar people because I chose you. Now, if you talk to a lot of the teenagers, you know, this word here, <laughs> this, this, word, this word means strange, odd, unusual, special, and set apart. If you talk to any of the teenagers, they'll agree that I've got that nailed to the T, at least the strange, odd, and unusual part. Okay? I've got that down. I can do that. I, I can do that. But we are to be different. We're, we're, to, we're to act different. We're to, to look different. We're, we're, to, we're to interact with people differently because we belong to somebody who is different. And in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, it says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the promises of the one who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. You see, being marked by God means that we have been pulled out of that darkness and we have been put in to this marvelous light. Listen, God has redeemed us and God has purified us. 
In 1 Timothy 2, 6, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, this man Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom. Listen, God redeemed us, but God also purified us. 1 John 1, 7 says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus. His son cleanses us from all sins. I am so thankful that I've been saved by grace. I've been taught by grace and I've been marked by grace. I'm so thankful that when God looks my direction, he doesn't see me, but he sees his son. He looks at me through the lens of Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful. But he also says, being this peculiar people, we are no longer sinners. We are no longer foreigners. Listen, being a peculiar people and being marked by grace means that we belong to the Savior. It means that we have a place to call home. We have someone we can identify in. It means that we are a part of God's family. What a wonderful thing to be marked. But he also says that we need to be eager to do good works. This little phrase indicates that we've got a zealous attitude towards doing good works. And it's not about what you do, hear me. I've told Jenny time and time again, if it ever becomes about me and my ministry, then I'm gonna turn my keys in and I'm walking away. It's not about me, just like it's not about you. Being eager to do good works is a byproduct of what God has already done within us, and that's why we do the good works. And this grace that God allows us to be marked with flows from every channel, or should flow from every channel of the believer that has been saved by the grace of God. We should live a life worth living. And if you're here this morning, you're not a believer, then you're not living the life to the fullest. There is no purpose, no direction for your life. You're just treading water. That's all you're doing. In Ephesians 2.8, it says, for, for you are saved by grace through faith and not of yourselves, Listen, if salvation was up to you and I, I may do more good deeds than you. And so I would think that my walk was better than yours <laughs> or your walk better than mine. But this verse here says that, that it's not of ourself. It is a gift of God so that we won't boast. Being marked by grace doesn't mean we boast in what we do. We boast in what God does. Well, as we wrap up this morning, can, can, can I just really talk to the believer here in the room? Just, just for a moment, just for a moment. Because we didn't, we didn't look at verse 15 and I read verse 15, right? Can I talk to the believer here? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands or stand or do anything weird. But I want you to understand, in this verse 15... It says that you and I as believers, Paul pulls out all these punches here and he says, you are to proclaim these things. You and I are to proclaim all of the truths that are tucked away in the blueprint that we call God's word. That's what we're supposed to do. That word means to preach, that word means to evangelize, and that word means to announce the good news. We're not exempt. We're not exempt from sharing the good news. I was called vintage the other day because I'm a grandpa. And then Miss Pat Foreman, when I told her that, she said, well, what does that make me? And I said, that makes you classic. Listen, no matter if you're a new believer, or you're a classic believer, or anywhere in between. 
this verse and this verse alone says that we are to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're to announce it. I get the image of the megaphone and corralling students on a trip, announcing the truth about God's word. That's what we're called to do. We're proclaiming that we've been delivered from sin, past, present, and future. We're, we're, we're claiming that we've been delivered from the power of the sin. We're proclaiming that sin's presence no longer is welcome. And that's what we should be doing. Now, unbeliever, can I talk to you for a minute? Unbeliever, you, you, have, been, you have been given, I hope and pray, a clear presentation of the gospel this morning out of Titus chapter 2. I mean, I, I don't know that it can be any clearer. Being saved by grace and being taught by grace and being marked by grace, I don't think it can be any clearer. And so, unbeliever, in just a moment, we're, we're going we're gonna to sing. We're going to have an invitation Please don't let Satan win. Don't hang on to the back of the pew to where Satan gets the victory this morning in your life. Trust me, the walk is not too far. And if you've been, you've been uh, moved by God and, and, and you want to turn your life over to him and, and you want him to be accepted into the family, well, guess what? When you make that walk, there are family that are around you that are going to love on you, that are going to welcome you in. Do not let the back of the pew win. If you need to, unbeliever, stop at any of those doors. And when we have our prayer time, if the walk is too far, you start to move when we start to pray. And you'll be down here, and then that walk that was a 50-foot walk becomes a 10-foot walk. Listen, it's not worth it. It's, it's not worth it for Satan to win. So where are we at this morning? Can we say we've been saved by grace, taught by grace, and marked by grace? If you can't say that, then I have to ask the question, do you belong to God? Are you his? Today could be the day that he completely rocks your world. Bow with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. <laughs> Dearly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you what I've been praying about this message for a little while. Lord, that as Isaiah 55 says, that the words that go out of your mouth, they will not return void. And Lord, those words that go out of your mouth, um, Lord, get used in the way that you see them to be used. So Lord, I just pray this morning that as we conclude the service, Lord, I pray that if you are piercing anyone's heart, Lord, Lord, I pray that you just allow them the freedom, the excitement, the joy to not only walk down the aisle, but come rejoicing down that aisle. Lord, they're amongst those that love them. And Lord, I pray that as believer, Lord, just as I was convicted, in preparation. Lord, am I doing what I need to do in discipling and training? Am I doing enough in, in the sight of you and bringing glory enough to you that, that is, is bringing other people along and discipling them and loving on them? Lord, allow you to become so real and so vivid in each life that's here today. Lord, thank you. In your name we pray, amen.
You want to please stand? God is good all the time. All All right, I believe Brother Ed Pavey's got some uh, closing words for us this morning. And not a one of them about ice cream, just so you know. (laughs) It is good to be a part of a congregation that worships together, fellowships together, reaches out to the community to try to 
take the name of Jesus Christ to the world around us. One of the greatest opportunities we have to reach out to the community and bring them in is Vacation Bible School. You've heard it. Maybe now it's just bouncing off your head, but VBS is right around the corner. This young lady right over here is looking, still looking for people to help, people to be plugged into Vacation Bible School. This will make an eternal difference in the lives of kids who come to our Vacation Bible School. An eternal difference. Everything that Will was just preaching about happens at Vacation Bible School. If you got that time available, the 26th through the, or whatever those dates are, the 26th through the, I am so well read on this. <laughs> through the 30th, I should know that date. Shouldn't I, sweetheart, yeah. <laughs> 43 years, so. Uh, we don't need all of you at our anniversary. We do need you at Vacation Bible School. Please see Cindy and uh, volunteer your time. Even if you can help just one of those days, it will help to be able to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, we know that the Southern Baptist Convention is going on. We know that our pastor's family is out there. Uh, we also know that our youth are going to go tell camp this week. Another incredible life-changing experience. And uh, please remember them in your prayers. Uh, that had a dynamic effect on our youth last year. Was it last year when they went? Or was it before COVID? Whenever it was. I think it was last year we had so many people go. <laughs> the affirming head nod over here. Thank you. Uh, but uh, uh, pray for those kids. Pray for our leaders as they go to, as they go to camp and they spend some really intense time uh, learning about Jesus Christ. Another incredible experience. Announcements you can see here in your bulletin on the back. The uh, Connect card uh, is there for you to, uh, if you're a guest with us today, you can fill that out so we have some way to contact you and uh, uh, learn a little bit more about you. Maybe you have some questions about our church. So do those things. Read that bulletin. There are uh, all those, uh, whatever these things are called, the U, not, they're not UPCs. What are the little thing, the little square boxes? QR codes, yeah, because I are not conversing. So, uh, <laughs> everyone, use a QR code. I'm still not sure exactly how those work, but, uh, but they do. So, uh, a lot of things going on, a lot of things to pray for. Love your neighbor. Spend some time shaking somebody's hand and tell them it was good to be here in the house of the Lord with them this morning. And let's close our time of worship this morning with a word of prayer. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for being a God who loves us incredibly more than we can fathom. We thank you for sending Jesus Christ to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. The love that surrounds us, the spirit who guides us, the peace that we receive because of what you've done for us. Thank you, dear God, for allowing us to be a part of this service this morning part of this family may we take the joy that we have found in jesus christ into the world this week a world that desperately needs to find that joy and that love that only comes from you be with us we pray in jesus name amen